Hey there, Walt here from Walt in PA, and today we're going to talk about this, my 2022 Yamaha MT-09 SP. I've had it for a little over a year now, about 8,000 miles, and I thought it was time to do a long-term review. So stick around and I'll tell you all about it. So before we talk about my experience with the Yamaha MT-09, I think it's important to just spend a minute or two and talk about how I came to be the proud owner of this particular MT-09 SP. Back in, I guess it was 2021, I was riding a 2018 Honda CB650F. It was a motorcycle that got me back into riding after a long break to have kids and start a family. And I was beginning to feel a little bit bored with the Honda, especially due to its uh, lack of features, lack of newer technology that I was seeing in a wide array of new motorcycles. And on a whim, I decided to check out the trade-in value and was flabbergasted to see that due to the current situation with the pandemic and supply chain issues, the bike was worth just as much in trade-in as I had paid for it, you know, a year and a half earlier. So I went from being interested, mildly interested in getting a new motorcycle to thinking that it was a no brainer given just how much I was gonna get on a trade. So that's what I did. I went over to my local dealership, which is Martin Moto in Boyertown, and I placed a pre-order for a 2021 Yamaha MT-09 SP. Now at the time, they had four bikes on pre-order. They hadn't come in yet. Three of the four bikes were spoken for, and the last one just happened to be an SP, which is what I wanted. So I put my deposit down on the bike, and the waiting game began. Now from the time I put my deposit down on my MT-09 until I actually received it, it took about five months due to, again, supply chain issues. The order was delayed a number of times, it was actually canceled once from Yamaha, changed to from a 2021 model year to a 2022 model year, and then delayed once more before I finally took ownership of it, again, five months later. Now when it arrived and I got a chance to start riding it, I was absolutely thrilled. The bike was just impressive all the way around. It was light, it was agile, it was powerful, it was comfortable. And I've been riding it lovingly ever since. So it's been a little over a year, 8,000 miles, and there, there are just a number of things to love about this motorcycle. I do not regret buying it one bit. And you know, along the way, there have been a couple of bumps and a couple of things I'm not thrilled about, but we'll get to those later. So first, what I love about the Yamaha MT-09 SP. So it may seem like a minor thing, but I really like the adjustability that comes baked into this motorcycle. So, you know, as motorcycle riders, we get a new bike and sometimes we can go down the rabbit hole trying to chase little things. You know, the handlebar position doesn't feel quite right, so we're going to buy this aftermarket accessory to make a tweak, or I'm not really crazy about the foot peg position, so we're going to buy this other thing to kind of tweak the location, the rear sets and whatnot. Uh, not real happy with the seat, we're going to buy a different size, different shape, different comfort level, and we go down the rabbit hole kind of chasing small adjustments. and. One aspect of the MT-09 that I think was really clever is that it comes with baked-in adjustability. Now, the handlebar position can be changed. So the handlebar clamps are offset. So you can take the clamps off, remove the handlebars, and then the mounts can be rotated 180 degrees. When you do that, when you rotate the clamp 180 degrees, or the base, it will push the handlebars forward 10 millimeters. Then you can bolt everything back down and now you have a longer reach if that's what you need. The foot peg position can also be adjusted. It is has two presets. The, the factory preset is the lower of the two presets. The other, you can unbolt the 
controls and raise them by 14 millimeters and back by four millimeters. So it's not two adjustments, it's up and back at the same time, which will raise the pegs and get them more rearward, giving you, uh, I guess, a, a more sporty riding position. So if you wanted this MT-09 to feel slightly more sport bike, you could raise and retract or pull back the foot peg positions and push the handlebars forward, which would give you kind of more of a crouched riding position. Now, the ride itself can also be customized a bit through use of ride modes. And those are all kind of built into the electronics of the motorcycle. This has a ride by wire throttle. And by having that, it allows uh, the bike to have ride modes. It also has a six axis IMU, which gives you lean sensitive brake control and traction control. They're tied into the TCS system. So uh, your TCS one has your slide control, your brake control, your lift control, all tethered together under one setting, preset a certain way. And then you have TCS2, which alters those settings. And then you have TCSM, which is a manual setup. So let's say you want maximum traction control, you want maximum braking control, but you're just into wheelies and you want the front end to come off the ground. You could set it to manual, go into the settings and set it up that way so that you get maximum brake control, maximum slide control, but your lift control is either turned down or turned off. Additionally, the MT-09 has four drive modes or ride modes. D mode one, which is sporty throttle response. D mode two, which is moderate engine response or throttle response. D mode three is mild. And D mode four is basically rain mode. It's model mild throttle response and it also limits engine performance. Now to go along with those electronics, this, also, this SP model also has cruise control. Honestly, I don't use it all that much. I don't do a lot of time. I don't spend a lot of time going down big straight highways. So uh, I believe you need to be traveling in excess of 31 miles per hour to use cruise control. And you need to be in fourth, fifth or sixth gear. And then you can set it and forget it. The bike will roll on just as you set it. The 2021 Plus MT-09, both the base model and the SP, use Yamaha's 890cc CP3 engine. Now, the previous generations also used the engine, but in the third generation, which again is 2021 Plus, uh, modifications were made to increase horsepower output by, I believe Yamaha claims 3% horsepower, 6% torque increase from generation two to generation three. Now, additionally, this motorcycle is, I believe advertised as 419 pounds wet weight, which makes it very light, very agile, and very, very fun. Power output is fantastic. In fact, it's probably way more than I need for the type of riding that I do, but it is nice to have kind of all that power on tap. So I found a place to park kind of give you a little bit of a walk around so you can see the bike and I'll point out a couple of things that are kind of noteworthy. So in terms of the dislikes, there are a couple. Uh, the first thing that you're probably going to notice is that is not a stock seat. The stock MT-09 seat is kind of terrible. Uh, it's just fine for riding around town relatively short trips i'd say it's comfortable for the first hour hour and a half but if you decide you you want to do kind of a longer ride it, it is <laughs> in every sense of the word a pain in the ass so what i decided to do was upgrade the seat to a comfort seat now i tried getting my hands on a yamaha comfort saddle back orders and such made that possible. I wound up going with this. It's a Bagster comfort seat designed for the MT-09. And as much as I like it, it's comfortable. It looks good. I would never buy another one. Uh, I had a severely disappointing issue with this seat and uh, Bagster refused to stand behind it. So I wound up having to take this to an upholsterer and have it repaired. 
uh, due to some issues under the seat where the the vinyl wasn't uh, attached properly and I had some stress splits underneath so you I would suggest getting a comfort seat but I would suggest staying away from Bagster just not happy with it or I'm, I'm not happy with Bagster I should say uh, another thing to point out is I, I really love the headlight design it's got this I lovingly refer to it as this cyclops headlight, this single element in the middle with these sweeping lights off to the side. So when the bike leans over, these side lights do a great job of illuminating the bend. However, the, the projector in the middle, it could be brighter. Um, it's not a bad light, it works well, but it could also be a lot brighter. Um, I, I ride a lot with a friend of mine who has uh, an Aprilo RS660. And if he's out in front of me and it's starting to get dark, you can see just a world of difference in the amount of light that his bike is putting off versus the limited light that I'm getting out of this. Again, it's not awful, but it's not great either. So another thing that, um, that, that may be mildly important is it's kind of a noisy bike. So I've left it run on purpose. And from what I understand, this is kind of uh, common with this particular engine and clutch setup. It's got kind of a rattle, so I'll, I'll shut up and let you hear it. And if I pull the clutch in, it gets quieter. And out. In. Out. It's mildly annoying. <laughs> it also has a bit of a clack when it is in need of an oil change. I recently had it in to Martin Moto for its 8,000 mile service and I, I had the service manager come out and take a listen to it and he said, yeah, it's kind of noisy, but it's, it's common for these bikes, so it's nothing to worry about. So after a few thousand miles, it starts to make a little bit of noise, but it's, uh, it's just a mild annoyance. So we can talk a little bit about uh, modifications I've made to this bike, and there really aren't many. I am very much a stock bike kind of guy. I, may, I like to make minimal adjustments, basically that aid in comfort. Uh, I'm not really a, a performance guy. I'll never pull this uh, exhaust off and put an aftermarket on. I like you know, quiet, relatively stock motorcycles. But some of the changes that I've made, I already talked about the seat. I put uh, tech spec tank grips on from TST Industries. Uh, I, I always ride in gear. I'm riding either in Kevlar pants or heavy textile pants, depending on the weather. And the, the grips are more to protect the paint from getting scuffed up than they are for grip. I mean, I will squeeze the tank and use them from time to time, but the primary function for me has been aesthetics and paint protection. I've also installed a set of ASV levers. Uh, this is something I saw on Blockhead's video. Um, they, they're, they claim to be unbreakable, so if the bike goes down, they'll kind of swing out of the way. But the one thing I loved about them was the radial adjustment. There's lots of little detents in there so you can get really fine-tuned adjustments basically you spin this knob and it will move the adjuster in and out which will change the lever position without having to mess around with the cable I've also installed a quad lock phone mount with a wireless charging head and a vibration dampener because this is a naked bike it's not like there's a fairing with a power port connected to it or tucked behind it so in my case, I had to get a USB power hub from Amazon connected to the battery and then run the cable actually out underneath the tank, around, back up, and it comes out right here where you can see it. I've got it zip tied here, back in here, and kind of stretched uh, just to keep everything in place. And it's worked pretty well. Uh, the only, the one thing to note is this the particular power port that I have uses um, it has an LCD display on it to give you the power output of the battery if you forget and leave that on 
it will drain the battery and you'll wind up trickle charging it before you can go out. Um, again, you have to forget it for about a week, but it has happened. So now ordinarily, I wouldn't call tires a mod, but these are not the stock tires, or these are not the OEM tires. It comes with Bridgestone Battle Axe tires, which uh, they're, they're a hyper, hyper max or hyper performance tire that that worked really well. I was happy with the performance. They did well in both dry conditions and wet conditions, but uh, the tire life wasn't fantastic. I think I got about 5,000 miles out of the rear tire before it was totally shot and I had to replace it. Um, in, in an attempt to get better tire life, I went with Michelin Road 6s. These got, I don't know, about 3,000 miles on them so far and I'm pretty happy with them. They seem to be wearing really well. They don't have a giant flat spot in them from you know those long straight rides commuting back and forth. And the, the performance has been great, both in wet and dry conditions. So I expect to have to replace these tires this season or before the end of the season. And I will most likely go back to another set of Michelin Road 6s. They're a little more expensive, but they seem to be the gold standard in terms of sport touring tires. So there's one more thing that I want to talk about. But it helps if I'm off the bike before I get into this long story. So the Yamaha MT-09 uses Nissan brakes. And I've had problems with this rear brake caliper. It had nothing to do with the caliper, nothing to do with the bike. It's just my own dumb fault. I stripped this nut when I was replacing the tires. I got everything apart, tire changed reassembled everything and I pulled the threads out of the, the back side of this brake caliper assembly and it led to a variety of issues. We'll talk about those when I get back on the bike. So more on that rear brake caliper. So as I mentioned I needed to replace my tires and in order to cut costs I decided to take the loose wheel over to the dealership and have them mount and bounce the tire for me no issues when I came home to put it all back together that's when tragedy struck uh, I over torqued the bolt pulled the threads out and was left with a mess the 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 threads were so damaged that there it didn't look like it was repairing them was going to be an easy task so I decided to go the route of replacing the entire brake caliper assembly uh, my dealership placed an order with Yamaha and I, they told me right away that this is a back ordered item it might take a couple of weeks to get so a couple of weeks go by and yamaha actually kicked the order uh, if if an item placed if an order placed with yamaha sits for too long without being fulfilled yamaha will kick it and force the dealership to reorder it well that happened on multiple occasions so they ordered the caliper yamaha kicked it because they couldn't fulfill it after a period of time my dealership replaced the order, Yamaha kicked it again after several more weeks, and just rinse and repeat. Finally, I had enough waiting and decided to have my dealership just not renew the order after nearly eight months of Yamaha not fulfilling the order for a new brake caliper assembly. Uh, the frustrating part is, meanwhile, they keep kicking the order, they won't fulfill it, but they're producing new motorcycles with this very same brake caliper on it. So it felt like I was I was not being taken care of as an existing customer. And fortunately, I was able to find a used rear brake caliper assembly on eBay, which got me back on the road again. Now, when I bought the used brake caliper, I left the order open with the dealership because I didn't know what kind of shape this brake caliper was going to be in when I got it. So just to be safe, I was going to hold the order and if I needed it, have it put on. So, but again, nearly eight months Yamaha uh, was unable to fulfill the order and it left me feeling like I couldn't depend on Yamaha. And that was actually the reason why I did not buy the Yamaha extended service plan, which is an extended warranty, because I felt like if they can't fulfill an order for a rear brake caliper, 
who's to say they're going to fulfill an order if some major component breaks? You know, how much downtime am I going, am I going to have then? I suppose that's a smooth segue into the Yamaha YES program. So YES stands for Yamaha Extended Service, and it is basically an extended warranty on your motorcycle. You can purchase it at the time of purchase when you get your motorcycle, or you can buy it within a year. So before your one year factory warranty expires, you can purchase the extended warranty. Now, the price kind of varies. For my 2022 Yamaha MT-09 SP, a one year extension on the YES program was a little over $300 if memory serves. The, you can get it for up to four years, which would have cost um, just under $600. With taxes and such, I think it was about $630 for the maximum term, which is the one I was considering. Uh, but again, due to fulfillment issues, I ultimately decided to not go that route. You know, one important thing to know about the Yamaha MT-09, if you're looking to purchase one, you should probably be aware that it is a relatively expensive motorcycle to own. I mean, comparatively speaking, it probably costs less to own this than it would cost to own a BMW or a Ducati. But um, it's got larger tires, so, you know, big sticky tires are more expensive than small tires. Uh, service intervals are every 4,000 miles versus, uh, was it 7,600 miles for a comparable Kawasaki Z900? Um, uh, if you were to get like a KTM Duke 890, I think the service intervals on that are close to 12,000 miles. Uh, Honda's comparable. That's also a 4,000 mile uh, service interval if you were to go with something like a CB. Uh, 1000R and insurance is kind of pricey too so I also have in addition to this motorcycle I also have a Kawasaki Ninja 400 I bought it after I bought this bike as a as a backup bike you know kind of back road fun bike and that bike costs less than half to to insure than the MT-09 SP so you know I guess it's important to realize you may be getting yourself into a position where it's not just the purchase price that you're looking at, it's also the cost of owning that bike. And what makes the 4,000 mile service interval worse is because of all the tech on this bike, there are diagnostics that need to be run. And one of those checks is the, the fuel synchronization. So in order to do that, your dealer has to lift the tank and perform the check. The, li the lifting of the tank and performing of the check is uh, an hour and a half service. Uh, my, my local dealership charges $110 an hour, so that equates to about 160 bucks for that one single aspect of the service all by itself. Now, if you're handy and you're comfortable doing your own services, you can dramatically cut costs in that regard. But if you are a by the book kind of person that wants to have the dealership perform all the services so that there are no hiccups with your warranty if an issue should arise, it's going to get relatively expensive. And that the cost is gonna go up based on how much you ride the bike. Obviously, if you're only doing a 4,000 mile service every year, it's not too bad. But if you're putting 8,000, 12,000 miles on the bike every year, you know, it's it's that service cost times two times three every year. So just food for thought, something to keep in mind. Now, when you buy a bike like an MT-09, I don't know that fuel economy is really high up on your list of priorities, but uh, it's important to note that if you buy one new, if you have an experience like mine, your fuel economy is going to be horrendous from the start. You know, that first 600 miles, that initial break-in procedure, I was lucky to get 80 miles out of a tank of gas before my fuel light came on. Uh, I think that equates to like close to 25 miles per gallon. Uh, I was I was a little worried when when I when I saw that initially, but after I had the ECU flashed because of a, a a recall issue, which should be squared away if you're buying one by now, 
and um, after I had that first service done, my fuel economy has gone up substantially. Uh, now I get roughly 45 miles per gallon, and on average, the type of riding that I do on mostly backcountry roads, uh, not very many miles on highways, I'm getting uh, 120 to 125 miles out of a fill-up. So if I were to run this bike until the fuel light came on, what, uh, just ignoring whatever is in quote-unquote reserve, I were and I were to fill it, I would get 120 miles to 125 miles out of the bike before that light came on again. Now, I haven't really ran it much past that light. I don't know what the what the what the reserve space is after the light comes on but um i have gotten close to 150 miles i got stuck away from a gas station once uh, it was a bit nerve-wracking i really don't know how much farther i could have gone but generally speaking 120 miles 125 miles between phillips is pretty pretty comfortable for me pretty average now i picked a really bad time to talk about it <laughs> with all these traffic lights ahead of me. But uh, the MT-09 is equipped with a quick shifter. It works both up and down. And it works pretty well. Um, this is the first bike I've ever owned that has had a quick shifter. So I don't have a lot of experience to judge it, but it's pretty cool. And I use it pretty frequently for upshifting and downshifting into curves. Usually if I'm using it, it's like from third gear up and you know all the way down So upshift I believe the engine rpm has to be above 2200 your speed It's it doesn't have to be all that high. I want to say 20 miles an hour ish is when the quick shifter becomes active um, To shift up you have to be accelerating you have to be open the throttle has to be open um, to downshift again you have to be off the throttle I, I think the shifting is is pretty smooth again I, I don't have a lot of experience with these with the exception of between first and second gear shifting up from first to second is very aggressive and <laughs> it feels very very sporty I guess you have to have the the RPMs up a little bit higher to get that that uh, dramatic snap from one gear to the next. Not really going to accomplish that coming through town. So the one thing I found with this quick shifter is you have to be deliberate. Uh, you can get lazy when you're up above second gear, but the shift from first to second has to be deliberate. You have to follow through, pull up on the lever. Um, if you don't and you just kind of lazily tap the shifter, there's a good chance the bike's going to go into neutral. Um, above second gear, it, it doesn't take much. A little tap under the shifter will easily pop it into gear. And downshifting, you know, you, you do kind of have to push it all the way through the range of motion. Um, you can't just kind of lazily tap at it with your foot. You've got to be deliberate. So to recap, the Yamaha MT-09 comes with some awesome features. Full LED lighting, adjustable suspension, ride modes, six axis IMU. It's just uh, loads of power, loads of torque, lots of fun. Awesome bike. I, I do not regret my purchase, not even the little, littlest bit. Along the way, there have been a couple of bumps, a couple of things that I'm not crazy about, but even factoring in those issues, I'd still buy another one. I, I really like this bike and I see myself owning it for a long time. Hopefully this video has helped you, I don't know, maybe push you on one side of the fence or the other if you were considering buying a Yamaha MT-09 for yourself. And uh, if you enjoyed this video, do me a huge favor. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. As always, ride safe, and I will catch you in the next one. How rude of me. I forgot to rev it up and let you hear it. There you go.